So under housekeeping, um, you will notice a bunch of changes to what you had last week. The most significant is that we've now set up um, with uh, the help uh, with the help of uh, the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology, uh, a course blog. You'll see the site there. I will do my best by the end of the day uh, to post everything from today uh, that I possibly can uh, on the blog and also send you uh, emails. Everyone decided that they wanted to have, at least last week, uh, a class email list. Um, I'm going to circulate the list. Please check your email to make sure uh, that I didn't mess it up. And anyone who wasn't here last week, please add your email address. Uh, among the, the, the other uh, housekeeping matter with respect to the syllabus, there are two more. Uh, you'll note that there's an upload site. You are um, asked, but uh, it's entirely optional that if uh, you want to record the class, record media, uh, by next week, uh, the Center for uh, Teaching, Learning, and Technology will have uh, that upload site working, and you'll be able to upload anything you want to it. And that uh, includes uh, any media that you record in this class, any comments, any questions, any issues, and all of that um, will be uh, or could be reused and repackaged ultimately um, in the digital rendering of this class. Uh, Last week, we went through the syllabus in um, some detail, but I just want to mention uh, a couple of things. Uh, in the obvious and stupid typo category, uh, class six um, is not on February 7. It's on February 6, which happens to be a, uh, a Wednesday. So not Thursday, February 7. Uh, I simply don't have the power to alter uh, the natural order of things. So I don't know where I invented that date. Um, we remain on Tuesdays throughout. The other thing um, that has changed very substantially from, uh, from the talk we had last week, which was pure introduction, uh, is that uh, there's been a flood of uh, willingness from invited guests to come speak to the class. Um, you will see that where someone has said yes, uh, there's an asterisk next to their name. Also done a first take on who may be speaking when. Um, Probably we'll have the final list and the final dates by next week. What has happened is that a number of people who I thought would join us remotely, uh, including uh, some lawyers from Microsoft and a couple of uh, senior counsel from San Francisco and Los Angeles, have said that they are actually intending uh, to fly up here. Um, to talk to you guys, which uh, is um, pretty cool and quite surprising. So uh, it looks like that will be a pretty stellar group. We are not going to dip into or need to dip into the other possible guest category. We're already oversubscribed, um, and it looks like I'm going to have to ask a few people if they would mind being together on a semi-panel. So, um, uh, so for example, uh, the two lawyers from EA, I think we may have them in together in, instead of separately. Um, 
To that end, uh, I am circulating two things. Um, we talked about sign-up sheets. So I'm thinking that uh, the groups are probably two, maybe three in some cases. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys thought about it. Um, I've, uh, I've, the the sign-up sheet is a little incomplete. Um, I don't have dates on everything, but you can refer to the syllabus. Um, and you don't have to do this today, but as you get groups together, um, please email me. And anybody who wants to sign up in a group, as per last week's discussion, um, tell me what dates you want. Um, it's not completely first come, first serve, um, but I'd like to operate on that principle to the extent possible. Uh, and then um, juggle from there. Also circulating attendance for today. For those of you who were not here last week, um, I do sort of, I, I am going to try and do a bit of an introduction to the course. Um, if I can figure out how to make this work. All right, I'm not getting a... All right, so now what do I do? Uh, as advertised. The wonders of editing. It's that one. All right. Okay. All right. Any questions to this point on anything uh, before I start taking you through an introductory slide on the course? Questions, reactions? Okay. Um, one. Let's just briefly talk about, uh, about marking. You'll see the evaluation uh, section. This is a two credit course, not a three credit course. So the participation mark, which is 30%, can include any and all of um, uh, participating on the web blog questions during class, uh, any kind of additional feedback uh, and contributions that you make. I don't want you to spend too much time at all, as opposed to other classes that are three credit, um, on the invited guest and creating some sort of 20 page synopsis of the law as a group. Um, the key is to get the guests here, have questions, much rather you spend your time on the web following video game law issues than um, creating as a group some sort of big presentation that happens in courses like this but happen to be three credit. I'd rather you focus everything on what's my paper going to be and what kind of paper do I write. And what information do I have that will make that a really neat paper? So you will see on the syllabus um, on page four, um, two versions, one mine and one my daughter's, of what the course is about. And you'll see it's all directed towards the paper. And the paper doesn't have to be literally a paper. You can do a video paper if you want. You can, there's a lot of different possibilities here. So the textbook, the discussion hour, your engagement, and my talks are all meant to get you thinking about what cool paper can I write. And that's where I'd like you to direct your effort 
because at the end of the day, this is a two credit course, not a four credit course. So I want it to feel like a two credit course. Um, have I talked in code enough to be comprehensible? <laughs> you guys know what I'm saying here? I suspect you do. Uh, I don't even have to go to the place of saying most of you are upper year and you, you, you understand the drill. You already have articles. So um, let's have a rockin' good time. Um, so a little bit about the origins of this course, briefly. Um, the course itself, Video Game Law, was taught for five years by me. It originally was this book. But what you don't know about this book is that, and this actually fits in to what we're going to be talking about today, before it was a book, it was a syllabus for a course. And I had taught here since 1993, uh, media and entertainment law, media and entertainment and sports law. And I really wanted to do something in, in video game law for reasons that hopefully you now understand. So I did a course uh, outline, and it was flatly rejected. Um, as way too out there <coughs> in 2004. Uh, but uh, LexisNexis and publisher, uh, friend, uh, Sonny Handa of Steichmann's in Montreal uh, said, well, you know what? I'm, I'm editing a series on uh, information technology law. You willing to turn your syllabus into a book? I said, yes. We turned it into a book. Of course, when it became a book, uh, it was quite easy for it to become a course again. But the original concept was this: this was going to be a course, and this is its actually natural um, uh, apotheosis, if I can use a big word. Um, the first year. Both UVic and UBC wanted the course, and we did an experiment which is in an antecedent to this video experiment. We had 12 students at UVic Law School, 12 students at UBC Law School. We had video conference room, which was far more primitive than this one. Um, and I alternated. Uh, I would fly over to UVic every second week and be here every second week. Uh, Ken Cavalier, I believe, was uh, uh, with me for that adventure. And we would both tell you that it worked out far better than we expected. Uh, and we had a very engaged class. And they didn't, uh, maybe they should have felt shortchanged, uh, but they didn't. Um, now, the key thing about this year is um, I threw everything up. I decided, uh, after five years of teaching the course, um, to rip it up and start from scratch. So the syllabus that you have in front of you looks absolutely nothing like, not even related to the syllabus uh, that Ken and I developed uh, five years ago. I literally started with a clean sheet of paper. Um, I'm not going to talk about pedagogic techniques because I don't know enough about them, uh, but I suspect that it's a sound practice that every five years you throw out everything you have and you start again. So um, uh, it feels cool to do that, uh, and hopefully there will be some benefits. If there aren't, we can always refer, revert back to the old syllabus. Uh, and maybe towards the end of the year, I will come in with, the, with an old syllabus and give it to you. Right now, I don't want to prejudice your thinking. OK. What is video game law? Um, why are we doing this? And why does it matter? And is it a unique area is, I guess, 
where we should start. When I wrote this originally, this felt like a unique area of law. It felt like it was different than most of the other stuff that was going on. And it felt like a unique nexus point of intellectual private property law, privacy law, freedom of expression, and a few other areas. Contract law, which you will hear throughout the semester, is the Trojan horse of the area was not as obvious a factor as it has become. Even though end user license agreements in terms of service were certainly around, their significance in 2005 was not nearly as obvious as it is today. Now, the area itself doesn't feel unique anymore. It feels to me, whereas there was once something called video game law, which was a form of largely very advanced IP law, the world has caught up. And video game law is, and video games are just the best, still the best, and still the most useful prism with which to look at digital technology meeting networked society. So video games become a great lens to look at what's going on in, in the world. Which takes me to a subject that actually came up last week. I, last year, I, uh, in Professor Joe Weiler's uh, sabbatical year, I took on media and entertainment law, which I've taught in the past. And uh, I am helping. Uh, Professor Weiler uh, again this year in that course, which happens at 3.30. And part of the discussion in that course last week was, well, what's the difference between that course and this course? And I tried to explain that they are entirely different, but I didn't have a good metaphor. And as always happens to all of us, the metaphor hit me that night. And really the way to look at the relationship between what we're doing and traditional entertainment and media law is to understand the metaphor of where physics is at or seems to be at today. Media and entertainment law is Newtonian physics. It's the observable world. Zohar was in the class last year. Um, it's the observable world that has been around for 50 or 60 years. And the legal precedents that relate to it are very much evolutionary and have their roots in doctrine and law that go back probably 100, 100 years. And it is fairly easy to yield predictable results. And unpredictable results are fewer and far between. Now what we know about Newtonian physics is that it breaks down in the, when things get really, really big or things get really, really small, hence other theories and continuing debates 
um, about string theory and other theories. But we know that at a micro level and at a huge universal macro level, what we know about Newtonian physics doesn't make sense. Similarly in the digital world. Media and entertainment law and precedence don't make that much sense in the digital world. It's a big pushback. Is it a separate area? It's for you to decide. My opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion, as expressed by your papers, does matter. Questions, comments, feedback. Please don't be intimidated by those guys. Do you think that more attention has been paid to it than more money has ended up in the video game field? Do you think more attention has been paid to the legal side of it? There's no question that for a variety of reasons, the and this is very normal. It's actually very normal in most mediums. They start off as a, in the periphery, and they move to the center. And as they move audiences, they attract, they attract uh, money, and they attract investment, and they attract additional creativity. So when you look at video gaming, you know originally. It was computer science people at MIT who had control in the 60s of some pretty large computers and thought it would be cool to play a space game with each other. But that's pretty hardcore. And gaming had very hardcore origins. And then over time, it started getting more popular. And certainly when we moved off of computers to consoles, it made it more accessible. But what's, I think, really happened is that mobile devices have attracted huge new audiences, including a lot of women, doubling the population of gaming. And with that mass audience has come investment in more content. So you may or may not like Farmville, but you can't argue that ridiculous numbers of people play it. And that gets people's attention. But I'll talk a little bit more uh, about your question and uh, a little further on. Any other I'm points? I was wondering, uh, when you talk about like the difference between uh, the media entertainment law side and the video game law side, uh, are you at all um, uh, discussing the interaction, like the interactivity of video games as opposed to the consumption of uh, media, like passive consumption versus interacting with the media? Yeah. So I think there, uh, Zohar's question is how does, if I can paraphrase, how does the interactivity of video games affect the view of traditional media? And that is a great point. Because one of the key differentiators, as we'll talk more about, is that once you move into the digital world, you can move into a two-way world. And traditional media and traditional art have one-way origins. And that, OK, that's a cool sort of cultural creative observation. What we are going to talk about today is how that has been seen and interpreted in the law and what the implications of that are. So that precise question is what we're going to talk about today. OK, um, last point. Uh, I will not quote 
from this or this um, because it's your job to read it and I don't want to quote myself and I um, am actually struggling with one question that I still don't know how I'm going to answer and that is whether I should quote a relative or not uh, but I'm probably going to have to do that later today. Um, in your materials, and I'm going to put a reserve copy of stuff out there, that, so the, the hardest thing to find, um, and so you, 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 I don't know that you absolutely have to read it, because hopefully I'll tell you enough about it, but I would encourage you to read it for reasons I will describe, is an article by Shaw, The Rise and Fall of American Mass Media, Roles of Technology and Leadership. There were very few articles that in 2013 you would say, this was written in 1991 and you, a group of UBC law students, need to read this sociology slash journalism article. It makes no sense. But it is a prescient and brilliant piece, and I've not really seen it replicated as clearly, or the ideas demonstrated as clearly as they are in this article. And what Shaw does is he looks at mass media, newspapers, magazines, radio, television, and he was just at the advent of cable and cable programming when this article was written. And, and the question that was clearly on his mind is what happens with cable and cable programming? What will happen to television? And so what happens when mass mediums are eclipsed by other mass mediums? It's a really good question. Do they decline and fall? Do they disappear? And some of this obviously depends on how you choose to define a mass medium. But mass, in this case, really does mean mass. means large audiences. The physics of this may be different if we're not talking about large audiences, if we're talking about small audiences. And by the way, all these notes will be posted somewhere or sent to you, so you don't have to type away. The shocking first conclusion is that what happens is not when magazines came, newspapers didn't decline. When radio came, magazines didn't decline. When television came, radio didn't decline. What happens is when a new medium, a new mass medium evolves and surpasses an old one, the old one flatlines and the new one just surpasses it. And then something else comes along and surpasses it. And as strange as it sounds, mediums don't fall off the table. And if you think about it from our perspective of 2013, much as we talk about the decline of the newspaper industry, they're still here. You walk to the corner, they're still a province, and they're still a sun, and you may know they're not really going anywhere, but they aren't disappearing either. And a large part of what Shaw does is try and encourage media leaders to innovate and not fall back. But for our purposes, 
And just remember when he's writing this in 91, and I, he would have written it in 89 and 90, delivered it in 91, there wasn't an internet as we know it. Gaming was not a mass media. So for our purpose, he says something brilliant. Historically, mass media seems to play the role of Trojan horse to social change. This, that seems to be an effect of evolving communication technologies. That's a little easier to see with Twitter. It's a little easier to see than with gaming, because gaming seems so distinctly unserious. But what I hope to show you is that video gaming is at the forefront of all of the technologies that we now recognize as social media and the digital social web. And that therefore we can look at the legal implications of that and learn some real lessons. Based on the place that digi or the video games currently sort of bring together the different pieces of technology and user interface, do you see something actually being able to eclipse video games and make them obsolete? Or are they? I, I don't right now. But I'm an old guy. And I suspect that if you went to Henry Luce and said in his day, if he was still alive, uh, sorry Henry, um, and said, uh, do you think that anything will eclipse magazines? Um, he would say no. <laughs> and uh, if you went to Bill Paley, uh, who came up with CBS, and said, do you think television will ever be surpassed? He would say no. Um, but you know what? As a quasi-academic, I will give you what I know is the correct answer. Yes, it will be surpassed. I just can't tell you how. It's inevitable. Um, what it'll be? But gaming, and we'll talk about this actually again, and we'll do this the theme of today, gaming will not disappear. How we will play games will change, and we may not recognize it as video gaming. It may merge a whole lot more with the real world. And I don't know if playing a 3D holographic game in a space that you've created that could be anywhere would be defined as a video game. I think it would be recognizable as a video game, but it would bear the relationship that today's um, uh, game of Call of Duty, um, Black Ops, um, just trying to add to my cred, um, <laughs> two. Yeah, two, exactly. Um, you know, it, it would bear the relationship 100 years from now that Call of Duty Black Ops 2 uh, has to a game of bridge. That would be my very safe prediction. Now the one thing about Shaw's paper is nowhere does it foresee the pivotal change. And the pivotal change is the audience's creator. When you're gaming, you are a form of creator. You are not only interacting but you're creating a unique experience. And again, a whole lot of legal strings dangle off that thread. Okay. So I advertised, but I want you to add if you can. So where do we have video games as Paragons of change. Where has it, where has gaming created firsts that other media 
have emulated and respawned into other things. Interactivity. Those early computer science students who were playing Space War off of a university mainframe, which they had no authority to do, of course. But you'll understand why that's a good thing. Um, they were doing multiplayer. They weren't doing single player. They were in different rooms. They were using the technology for what it could be used for. So not only did you have interactivity, but you had multiplayer built in from the earliest form of gaming, forms of gaming. It diverted, but it was, it was always there. The notion of control, you know, the Kinect ads, you know, all about your control of the game. Well, that was built in right from the beginning. I mean, the mouse as a control mechanism, very useful in gaming. I'm not saying it started as a, as a gaming um, tool, but gaming certainly, video gaming certainly popularized it. Use of voice, use of gestures. Gaming certainly made contribution. Online community. Yes, there have been online communities from the very beginning of the digital age, but mass communities, very often around gaming. Doom, the Doom community, the Grampy Legends community, the uh, on and on and on games created community. There is a, a side, but I want to I want to raise it in a piece in the New York Times um, on religion. A uh, group of atheists were pondering how when a tragedy has happened in New Jersey occurs where senselessly children in a grade school are murdered by a maniac, that the religious communities seem, know, seem to know just what to do. And they, there's a lot of comfort, and families go to religious services, and there's multi-faith services, and all sorts of things happen around religion. And if you believe in a just humanistic, atheistic ethic, that community doesn't seem to do so well. And so what, you, what I took from that, and what you can take from that, is that this navel gazing about building community means that building community is not an easy thing to do. Yet, in the video game world, for reasons I don't fully understand, but would make a great paper, including its legal implications, building community has seemed relatively easy. And that's sort of fascinating when you hear people frustrated by their inability to build community, yet in a particular world, the world that my 17-year-old son in, inhabits, um, building a community around Halo, or being part of a, a community around Halo, seems like the most easy and natural and necessary thing to do. So it is interesting to ponder 
why games so easily create communities, and then to start thinking about the implications of that. Um, voice over IP. Well, we had voice over IP in video games long before we had Skype. People were talking to each other all over the world, communicating all, uh, over voice on how to frag this and how to kill that uh, a long time before anything else was going on. Open worlds, avatars, 3D, virtual reality, portable gaming. We've had portable gaming for ages, um, long before the iPhone. So we understood as gamers portability. What have I missed? In terms of video game firsts? Yeah. But you also have the hardware for the video game systems where they've had these situations where they've taken the graphics cards for 500 PlayStation 2s and networked them up and by doing that made things like one of the world's fastest 500 computers. Brilliant. Networking computers had uh, certainly either through the community part or through the technology part, and really through both, created um, various technological breakthroughs. I should add to that mods. Um, uh, you know, and now we're, we're living in a world where we hear all the time about you know, how you change content and modify content mm -hmm. and turn it into what you want. Well, gamers have been doing that from the very beginning. Say, but also, I think it was Watts and the IBM computer that played Jeopardy. I think that was the one made out of PlayStation 3 parts. Uh, so the, uh, the PlayStation 3 parts was a Jeopardy game? No, they, turned, they used those parts to build the computer to play Jeopardy. Oh, they used a, a yeah, PlayStation to build? I didn't know this. So they used the PlayStation to build the computer that Plays they, Jeopardy. They use the parts. I think it was something about how the RAM was connected. I can't remember exactly. Yeah. So lots of the point being, lots of technological breakthroughs that fed other things. Okay. So now, continue our journey. What is a game? As we go through this. And as we go through the course, let's remember that when we talk about the legal theme of constraints on creativity, which will come again and again and again, that before we have creativity, we have play. And whether play is related to fun or play is related to something larger, and whether fun is related to something larger, we have to remember that video games come from games Games come from play. And play seems to be a basic human function. Now I'm going to do the thing that I said I was a little uncomfortable doing. But it's important, it's a little bit personal, but I'll apologize for that in advance. Um, I have a relative who I met once in my life. Um, he passed away a number of years ago, circumstances that I will shortly describe. Uh, he was a very famous psychologist. His name was Leon Festinger. He came up with something called the theory of cognitive dissonance, which if you were a psych student, you would have heard of. That doesn't matter as much as for our class. That matter, it matters a lot to an awful lot of people. But it doesn't matter for our class, and that theory doesn't matter, 
except to the following extent. After 30 years of running a lab at the New School for Social Research and elsewhere, um, towards the end of his life, he decided to close his lab because he felt that he wasn't getting to any real answers. I think that's really hard for a celebrated academic who's done a lot of groundbreaking stuff to say, gee, this ain't working anymore. I'm not getting at the deeper things that I'm wondering about. So he closed his lab and delved deeply into cultural anthropology, physical anthropology, and he really tried to understand evolution. And he wrote a book called The Human Legacy. Um, and I only read it a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, to be precise. And there was a shocking paragraph right in the introduction. So he explains that the work he had done was not that satisfying anymore because he wasn't getting at real at answers to real questions. And then he talked about what some of those real questions are. And he cited a couple of them. And remember that he's going to, he's really writing a book about evolution and what he thinks human evolution looks like. And he cites a couple of things as conundrums. Here's one that obviously shocked me after I had spent my life in a similar, uh, in, in media and entertainment and video gaming, my professional life. Equally strange is our general addiction to games, both physical and mental. The profusion of games is truly startling. Card games, board games, word games, ball games, electronic games. This is early 80s. <coughs> He's writing this. Some games are entirely dominated by chance. Others mix chance and skill. While still others are games of complete knowledge in which only skill matters. Some games are competitive. Others are played alone. We even assemble in huge crowds to watch others playing games. What does all this mean? Do we simply get easily bored and cannot tolerate inactivity? I can find nothing in the literature of scientific psychology that helps me understand such bizarre behavior. And he goes on, remember this is the introduction, to wonder what function, if we game the way we do, if we play the way we do, everything we know about how we are designed suggests that there must be an evolutionary purpose to it. So we always talk about the evolution of gaming. Think about how gaming evolves us. And now, when you think about the firsts, especially when you think about how we are creating digital communities, and you start putting those firsts in an evolutionary context, maybe you start wondering about And then the relationship between that and technology, to go to your question, also becomes fascinating. So um, and then one of the other things he's very equally curious about is art and creativity and what function it plays. Because again, on one level, it seems like just a waste of time. Now in gaming, you see play and art come together. You also see, I was alluded to earlier by you, 
the core point of interactivity. And the departure from traditional analog media that Shaw was dealing with and what video gaming is. And from here we'll go to the, the legal implications. But simply put, think about television. Television actually is wonderful because it has as its functional word something very symbolic, the transmitter. Television works on the paradigm of a literally a transmitter, old analog television does, and you as receiver. Video gaming flips the paradigm. Whether it does so for real or it just feels like it does, we'll talk a lot more about. But I actually will, will put to you that it does it for real in massively multiplayer environments um, and endless spaces. I don't think you can argue anymore that it's all set up. But the reality is when you're playing a game, you feel like the transmitter and you are the transmitter. And you are the controller. And the world is moving to you. And moving around you. And you are changing the world. Whereas traditional media, traditional art, comes from the opposite place. It moves you. You don't move it. It transmits to you. You receive. long before you were born, and I know it's completely inconceivable to you, to change the channel you had to physically get up, go to the television, and change it. You didn't even have the freedom of the clicker. Another brief thought. on this artistic point. I did this on purpose. This is a student paper from the University of Alberta. So I want to try and get across that you can do this too. Um, Conrad Liebel wrote a paper called Mass Effect and Orality, Video Games as Transitional Literature. And he makes the argument that video games are the return of the oral narrative. But we've gone through the literary written down phase, and if you really want to understand video games, think of them as traditional storytelling and traditional storytelling cultures. Now, from a legal perspective, this is kind of interesting because if you look at it closely, you will understand that intellectual property law has had a hard time dealing with storytelling cultures and intellectual property around storytelling cultures, largely native indigenous cultures, that choose not to write things down. Why is that difficulty there? Because in the Western idiom of intellectual property law, we tend to require something called fixation. And we tend to understand that something attracts intellectual property protection once it is put on paper, which means it's written down, which means you're going to have a hard time with oral storytelling. So here's your first kind of legal clue that we're starting to get into some mountains to climb in terms of how we resolve intellectual property and video games. Apparently the trick is to hold this up. 
Now, we will have entire talks about this. And I propose to have a break after this point. But a recurring theme from the beginning of video gaming, legal principles <laughs> until now. It's always been how do real world laws apply to the virtual space? And you will find tons of material <coughs> in your materials, in the books, on this subject. Um, and I'm going to take you through, I, I put up Ben Duransky's piece because um, it neatly summarizes an approach but you will find multiple approaches. And those approaches go all the way from there, this, there is only the real world. And therefore, real world laws apply to everything in the real world. And what you think of as the virtual world is just as real as this table and is a product of the same bits and atoms as this table. And laws are laws. And a civil society is a civil society, and it applies. To notions of the magic circle, we have to protect play, and play belongs within a magic circle. And although laws apply, they should stop at the perimeter of the circle. To, and I remember the first time I heard this, I thought, and it was at a, it was, from a very responsible academic at a very responsible academic conference, all the way to the virtual world has to be its own country, it has to have its own governance, and it should have nothing to do with the domestic laws of any other known entity. No other country. No other corporation. The virtual world should have its own flag, its own constitution, and it should be crowd-based and ultra-democratic. And when I heard that in 2005, it struck me as shocking and borderline irresponsible. But when, remember I'm an old guy, you guys are way ahead of me. But when you see the Great Firewall of China, when you see some of the things that are going on in the world, and how the digital world doesn't fully, in all cases, enable freedom and can be used as a tool of government to restrict freedom, you might have a little bit more sympathy for that notion of the internet as a country, as its own country. Thoughts, questions, ideas, suggestions, push back before we break. Now that I've thoroughly put you to sleep, let's take 10 minutes. We'll come back and finish it off. Yeah.